everybody. Welcome to a, another episode of Energy in Transition, a series of interviews with key players in the renewable and sustainability sector, taking a look at our journey to net zero. I'm Levent Gradenli, a energy lawyer and partner at Waitmans. And today we are going to be taking a look at one of the success stories of the last decade, uh, solar. Um, and, you know, it's staggering to think that at the end of 2019, 13 and a half or just under 13 and a half gigawatts of capacity was installed nationally, um, which, as I say, is a remarkable uh, journey and exponential growth from where it started just 10 years ago. I am delighted to be joined today by Pete Bolton, who is an investment director at Foresight Group and is very active uh, together with his colleagues in the solar sector. So before we crack on, Pete, would you mind just uh, introducing yourself a little bit about what uh, you do and, uh, and who you are? Hi, Lev. Yeah, um, thanks very much for having me this morning. Um, it's my first experience of such things <laughs> in advance. Um, but yeah, no, great to, great to talk about foresight and uh, the solar sector in general. Um, in terms of my personal background, I've been at Foresight now for six and a half years. So have seen the business grow substantially in the infrastructure and renewable energy sector in general. And um, solar has always been one of our most visible um, segments. So um, my title, as you mentioned, is uh, investment director within the infrastructure team. Um, that infrastructure team looks across um, all renewable energy technologies and some non-energy um, um, specific asset classes. Um, and my time is, has historically been split between bioenergy transactions and, and solar transactions. So um, yeah, look forward to sharing some thoughts on the solar sector. Thank you very much. And so kind of before we uh, get into some more detailed questions, perhaps you could tell us uh, about some interesting developments within kind of the foresight or the sector over the last 12 months that you'd uh, care to share? Yeah, so um, I guess, as I said, I've, I've, I've been around foresight for long enough to see the mm. infrastructure arm grow quite considerably. Um, as a business as a whole, now foresight's assets under management are um, around 4.7 billion, so um, consistently growing. Uh, managing a number of different fund mandates. Um, in terms of infrastructure and, and energy generation specifically, our combined generation capacity is now over 2.2 gigawatts, which we're, we're very proud of. And um, a good proportion of that, I think around 1.3, it is dedicated to, to solar assets. Um, I suppose, unlike, as I mentioned, unlike some other fund managers, we've always um, be managing a number of different fund vehicles with different types of, of capital behind them. And um, I suppose the, the good thing about that is that we tend to be able to find the right funding solution for most types of infrastructure deals that come our way, whether they be at sort of brownfield operating very, very steady and, and low risk end of the spectrum, down through to construction assets and, and increasingly, which is something we'll touch upon today, um, mm -hmm. to look at um, development stage assets as well. So bring it back to, 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 to um, the purpose of today's discussion, Foresight remains hugely focused on its core market of, of solar as well. Um, all the other infrastructure sectors that, um, that were available to it. Uh, and I guess our overarching goal is how do we retain our existing strong market presence in the solar sector as we're seeing changes in, uh, in how UK solar, for example, um, is going to develop over the, the short and mid term. So how do we hold our market share, which is approximately so 10% of commercial mm -hmm. solar, um, in an unsubsidized world. Brilliant. And as I mentioned earlier, the you know, solar has been a tremendous success story for the, uh, for the UK. 
Um, and uh, I think I mentioned earlier as well, 30 and a half gigawatts, I think total uh, installed capacity at the end of 2019. Um, however, a lot of that has been, uh, or the vast majority of that has been off the back of subsidies, uh, whether yeah. feed-in tariffs or rocks. Um, could you now kind of describe what the, the scale of the opportunity is for subsidy-free solar in the UK, which is obviously the next phase that the, uh, the market needs to go through? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, 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 the scale is, is huge and the scale um, that's been called for is, is also um, very significant. So um, I, I think the, the Committee on Climate Change believes that we need to get to the UK solar capacity of around 54 gigawatts in order to hit our net zero targets uh, compared to the 13 gigawatts or so of current capacity that you mentioned. So. There's clearly a lot to go after there um, if we're going to meet those goals. Um, in terms of what's practical, um, what's already in the, the pipeline. So there's, a, there's around nine gigawatts, as I understand it, of um, pipeline planned projects that are within the planning application process. So, you, you know, that represents a pretty meaningful addition to our current capacity. And I think that reflects, if I'm being honest, more of the, the developer community's enthusiasm and ambition. And the challenge is how does that developer community get hold of the underlying capital from people mm -hmm. from foresight and from the senior lending community, um, I guess, to justify that enthusiasm that they've, um, that they've shown. So I, I think some of that pipeline will obviously be projects that were originally envisaged to be rock accredited subsidized projects and weren't built out um but you know th there will be within that nine nine mega sorry nine gigawatts of, of uh, capacity some some pretty substantial projects that look highly attractive on a subsidy free basis um so we're very actively looking at how to make that work um, I think we'll explore uh, within our discussion various strategies for doing that. It, it's fair to say that our investor base and, and the investor base uh, of our competitors will be used to seeing UK solar as a subsidised revenue stream mm. with um, mm. a certain level of return expectations and, it, it, and that represents a challenge I suppose to the subsidy free solution. Um, I suppose we need to find a way to, to mimic those trends as much as possible and um, it's possibly more challenging in the UK than perhaps some of the other markets. If we were, you know, if this discussion were about Spain, for example, we would be talking about a market that's far more mature from an unsubsidized perspective um, due to its higher irradiation and more mature PPA structures than the UK. But the expectation is that this opportunity will emerge increasingly in the UK. There are some helpful um, sort of tailwinds. EPC prices are expected to fall. O&M prices are expected to fall. And um, I, I think we're all waiting for further clarity. But um, it may be that we don't need to focus too much on unsubsidized because the CFD um, sub the reality. So um, I think what I'd say is Foresight's dedicating a lot of time to, to unsubsidized um, solar. And I, I know that many of our competitors are doing the same. The challenge is how to find the right structure. And um, I think we're going to explore some of those um, potential avenues as we, we continue our discussion today. Thank you. Yes, uh, I would actually like to, if that's OK, drill down a little bit more into, as you say, um, some of the challenges associated with the deployment of subsidy free projects, because, uh, as you mentioned, the, the pipeline is 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 very encouraging. If you look at it just in terms of absolute numbers, but equally, not all of those projects will come to fruition or be built out. Um, so yeah, what are do you think to you? What are the main challenges to uh, the deployment of those projects currently in the pipeline? 
Um, and you know, what do you think we can do to overcome them um, to, uh, to really, really supercharge their deployment in the future? Yeah, I suppose um, I'll probably highlight two different types of challenge. Um, and then I can touch up on them both in a little bit more detail. Starting with the one that I suppose I understand the most, that's investment returns. Um, so as I mentioned, the subsidy obviously has boosted the revenue streams for these um, types of assets. We're no longer there. So how do we uh, overcome the gap in return expectations? And then the, um, the other item that I guess I'm less expert on, but seems a natural barrier is, is the planning process and the, I guess, the, the mechanisms which we have in the UK to, to simply push that volume of capacity through the planning um, process and turn it into a reality. So perhaps, um, I guess, starting with re returns, how do we overcome the, the gap between the subsidised and the unsubsidised? Well, um, there are big sort of calls from the solar community um, to, to sort of lobby for um, support in addressing this. So um, one great example of that would be, would be business rates. Uh, mm -hmm. Some um, requests that um, businesses that have solar installed perhaps on their roofs or enjoying the benefits of solar may um, receive some relief from business rates. And, and equally, we would expect that sort of treatment to extend to um, the underlying solar panel investments themselves in, because they're clearly generating a, a service that's in demand and that's being requested um, to, to fulfill our net zero targets. So th there's, there's pressure there, which um, industry groups are, are, are seeking to exert. Um, similarly, you know, there have been some relatively recent unhelpful changes in the, the revenue streams in the market, including the removal of the embedded benefits um, revenue. So um, having that sort of conversation in conjunction with the sort of tax related ones is, um, is, is well worthwhile. Uh, and then finally, we, I've already mentioned it, but um, we're talking about how to solve the return gap due to a lack of subsidy. Might it not be possible that some form of subsidy remains um, that there have been uh, solar projects that have qualified for contracts for different scheme mm -hmm. and it's been suggested that the contracts for difference will return um, one would hope in the future that there'll be a regular six monthly auction process that um, allows projects to to participate even if it doesn't meaningfully change the return it will clearly have a big impact on the perceived risk profile of a solar investment, which then unlocks a whole new uh, world of potential investment and investors. Um, and then finally, just to, to add a bit of flavour to the planning process, um, if our objective is to get to scale, we need to find a way to quickly push things through planning. At the moment, there are levels at which um, an asset capacity, if it reaches beyond a certain scale, it has to go to a national planning process, which carries greater timetable uh, duration. And so I guess one uh, potential thought might be a consideration of changes there to encourage the um, development and build out of much larger solar sites. Um, some of which we're beginning to see now, but that those planning processes will have taken a good, a good amount of time. I mean, absolutely. I mean, Cleve Hill is a good example, isn't it? You know, several exactly. hundred megawatts yeah. of, uh, of power recently consented going through that process, but it has taken a couple of years at the very least um, to, uh, to do so. Uh, yeah. And yes, I think the, the limit is, uh, is 100 megawatts, as far as I understand, in terms, of, uh, in terms of when it crosses that threshold. And if we're going to see a world in the future where actually there is more scale, as you say, then, uh, then that perhaps is something to, uh, to consider. Um, to uh, to speed things up or to at least streamline the process in a more effective manner. So um, thank you for that. Very interesting. Um, one of the things or one of the trends that, uh, that, I, that I'm seeing, you're seeing, I think, as well uh, at the moment is uh, for funders such as Foresight uh, and others as well to be getting involved at an earlier stage um, of, uh, of projects and providing 
development capital and taking more of that development risk than otherwise they might have done in the past. How you know can that be used? Do you think, or do you think, first of all, it's an effective strategy um, for the deployment of subsidy for, uh, subsidy free projects? And and perhaps you explain why you think that is as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it goes without saying that it's happening more and more. Um, even in the in the news this week, there have been some very established large energy investors that have announced big plans to have increasing exposure to development capital. I suppose you've got to remember where we come from. So most people, including Foresight, have deployed funds into the solar sector, um, primarily into existing operating subsidized assets. And as, as those assets have, uh, are now increasingly scarce and the returns attached to them are much lower, it's quite common that people are considering construction risk or, or greenfield risk in the first instance, and then some are taking that one step further and looking to um, provide capital to the developers and to work with the developers um, as well. So I guess who is that benefiting and why is that a, a good idea if it can be done in the right way? So. Um, from a funder's perspective, yes, there is a greater risk exposure, but it's a way to enhance returns um, by buying into a project at an earlier stage and also to gain um, exclusivity, I suppose, over the future funding of the asset over its long term life. You know, some people are looking at solar projects now as having um, 40 year asset lives. Um, in terms of the, the developer, it's also of great help to them because typically these aren't big businesses. Um, they, they tend to have relatively um, constrained balance sheets and freeing up the capital um, invested, investment required from their perspective by taking capital from the likes of a, a, a Foresight or another fund manager means that they can target a a build out of a much larger pipeline and look to recycle the capital that they see um, alongside the funders and uh, helping, I suppose, the, the build out to be far quicker. So um, I guess it's, it's a great idea. What we've got to recognize is that it's a departure from what most people are used to. So you need to find a way to um, extract its benefits from a funder's perspective without massively increasing the risk profile. Uh, and one thing that we've been seeking to, to do in the solar sector is to explore that um, by seeking partnerships with developers who have quite mature sites, but not yet fully consented and ready to build. And so often what, what's possible is a conversation where, which says, you've got a site, that's great. You've got a, a, an option to lease. Um, around an agreed contract. You've also got a, an approved planning, uh, sorry, an approved grid, um, grid application. What's missing is your, your planning application. That tends to be the last thing that a solar developer does. Um, it also tends to be one of the more costly components. But if you've already got the planning, so you've already got the grid and the, the site, and you're an experienced developer, it's quite possible to mitigate the risk of a, of a failed planning application quite successfully. So what we're hoping is that by working with the right developers and, and selecting the right sites, um, you can actually manage the perceived development risk quite carefully. Um, so we think it's attractive. Clearly what also needs to remain the case is that the underlying projects themselves are going to be attractive to a long-term owner. So um, you still need to ensure that you're developing a high quality project and you therefore need to be very careful in terms of thinking about the project specific components that drive returns in particular, what's the grid connection cost likely to be um, and you know, what the, the land cost or the, the lease cost may, may look like as well. Okay, that's uh, yeah, really, uh, 
very insightful and, and good advice as well to uh, to developers out there who uh, who might be thinking about these sorts of things as well. Which uh, yeah, uh, I'd encourage them to, uh, to to take that on board. Um, I'd, I'd like now to look at um, uh, another aspect of a very important aspect of these projects. Uh, the, you know, the route to market. Um, and, and in particular, as you said, we're trying to get to a point where as far as possible, you're replicating a, a subsidized model to, uh, to kind of remove that element of risk. One way you might be able to do that is if you have a long term uh, corporate PPA with a really solid uh, counterparty. Um, how important as a route to market do you think corporate PPAs will be uh, for the future deployment of subsidy free projects? Um, and, you know, are there alternatives that you're uh, looking at or, or looking for? Yeah, I, so I, I think at the moment, the corporate PPA is our um, best weapon, I suppose, to ensure a build out of unsubsidized solar in the UK. Um, as you mentioned, it, it grants the funder comfort over a period of fixed revenues, which is exactly what was available under the subsidy regime. And if you can find a investment grade counterparty with all of the right um, credit checks being successfully ticked off, it can be quite a powerful tool to unlocking funding both from equity providers such as Foresight, but also from the, the banking community. Um, I think as I say, um, this is really the, the first thing, the most immediately addressable thing and uh, that, that's available to us. And, and there are many people, be it funders, advisors, and um, standard utility PPA providers who are working very hard to sort of unlock this as a more common route to building out Greenfield Solar in the UK. Um, the, the other thing that would be ideal um, which is less um, currently available in the UK than it is in some other markets such as Spain, would be rather than a corporate PPA, the potential for what, what we would call a long-term utility PPA. Mm -hmm. um, commonly in the UK, it's quite hard to get fixed price PPAs for any duration much beyond two or three years. Um, there are other markets where it's possible to get that sort of power price hedge for sort of 10 years or more. Um, and if that became a product that were more straightforward and, and more um, comfortably offered, I suppose, by the utility, then that could, could have many of the same um, characteristics as a corporate PPA in terms of um, unlocking funding. The benefit of the corporate PPA is clearly that it allows the, the off taker themselves to point to their green credentials and to, to emphasize that the, the power that they're using is from um, a, a sustainable source. That, that will still be relevant to a lesser degree for the utility, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's that driving force that might unlock um, more and more um, uh, unsubsidized solar if we can get it to work at, at real scale. Yes, and, and absolutely. Corporate PPAs are, on the face of it seem to be, you know, a win-win uh, situation for, for generators uh, and off-takers alike. Uh, but in the UK in particular, although they're on the rise, I mean, there's not that many of them in, in, in terms of absolute numbers. What kind of trends are you seeing uh, in corporate PPAs at the moment uh, in the UK that uh, you know you may or may not be encouraged by? Yeah, I mean, as I say, um, there's a lot going on. Um, at any one time, we're, we're probably aware of half a dozen different corporate PPA tenders, um, each of which are structured in slightly different ways in terms of what they're looking for from either the developer or the funder. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say, just as a, a slight word of caution, that structuring a corporate PPA has, whether it's a, a physical connection uh, through our private wire or through a sleeved arrangement, um, which is more traditionally what we refer to as a corporate PPA, it's never been easy. Um, often you're dealing with 
the procurement department of a business that has a large number of costs that it needs to manage for the ongoing operation of its business and power is just one of those components so you're not necessarily always dealing with someone who is expert in what historical and future power prices are expected to be um, equally if you then um, think about the larger end of the, the corporate PPA uh, process it's quite common we see that um, these tendering processes are run through very um, very much faceless uh, procurement portals which which makes it challenging to find a sort of bespoke solution that might work best for funder and for off-taker so you lack that sort of relationship element sometimes and you commonly have to jump through a very large number of hoops in order to submit a, a compelling and compliant um, tender I suppose so, yeah it's, it's never been it's never been easy um, I, I guess when you add today's current market concern uh, you know uncertainty linked to, to, to COVID etc um, I suppose it's also hard from the the off takers perspective how do they easily form a view as to how their business is going to look in 10 years time which is effectively the sort of contract duration that someone like Foresight would be looking for to, to give the, the corporate PPA um, real sort of strength um, so it, both side needs both sides need to be willing to sort of jump into it and and consider that the risk and the reward associated with fixing the price and the the, the green um, green and sustainable credentials of the power uh, and, and I think it's that sustainability point that hopefully keeps keeps everyone enthusiastic despite the, the, the challenges that I've just shown um, there's a huge amount of positive um, emphasis on this within the corporates there's a huge push from people like us because it's our best route to continuing to deploy capital in the solar sector on high quality projects I think the, the key element is both the, the off taker recognizing where they need the help of an advisor to structure their procurement process for corporate PPAs and the off taker seeking to work with a funder hopefully someone like Foresight who can demonstrate that they're experienced in this sort of structure and uh, and therefore there aren't going to be unexpected twists and turns throughout the, the sort of um, development stage of the corporate PPA as, as the sides get to know each other a little bit better. Absolutely, thank you for that. And I'm just picking up on one of your points, I, I, I agree with you that the, the value of a corporate PPA or any uh, sustainability strategy that an organization has, I think far, goes far beyond just the utility savings uh, that could be achieved where, you know, whether it's in terms of attracting or retaining uh, staff and employees who are increasingly concerned about these things, um, whether it's, as you say, improving their reputation and indeed getting external uh, investment as well. Uh, it's something that is on the agenda uh, for, for all major investors. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with that to, uh, to look at the wider, bigger picture when, uh, when considering these things. Um, kind of moving uh, slightly on, given you know, what we've spoken about in terms of uh, you know, some of the risks associated with these projects in terms of uh, the route to market, whether or not you can get a corporate PPA, uh, whether or not you can uh, mitigate planning risks and things like that. Um, you've spoken about uh, foresight, but how do you think the, the senior lenders uh, are looking at you know, unsubsidized transactions and, and how they could get comfortable providing debt into these sorts of uh, these deals? Yeah, I suppose it's fair to say that the, the senior lending communities also always um, enjoyed investment in the UK solar sector. Um, traditionally, particularly for a subsidised project, it's been possible to secure very high levels of gearing for a, for a particular project. Um, so much like equity, they also are looking for routes to continue their um, investment in UK solar. Um, and in our experience they've been very supportive therefore and we've taken projects to them and said look 
we'd like to um, submit a bid for this unsubsidized asset. Um, these are its characteristics underpinned by an attractive corporate PPA. Um, how would you see the, the terms? What sort of terms can you provide to us? So in general, um, that they're very um, happy with the overall proposition. Um, I think they took the decision a while ago that they don't consider construction risk, construction stage solar assets to carry vastly more significant risk than an existing operating asset. Um, unlike some of the other um, renewable energy classes, solar is seen to be um, very straightforward from a construction perspective, perhaps even more akin to an installation rather than a construction um, risk. So I think that I wouldn't necessarily differentiate hugely between the demands of a, of a senior lender and, and of equity. Um, we're both trying to find high quality projects. Um, we're both trying to replace the, the fixed revenue stream that's missing in the absence of a subsidy. And we're both trying to do that. Um, perhaps in the first instance, by looking at the corporate PPAs and, and private wire PPAs um, underpinned by high quality um, off takers. The, the, the one area where the banks will be experts is that, I guess in a slightly confusing um, way, they may already be a lender to that corporate or to corporates um, of a similar nature to the proposed um, PPA off taker. So they'll have to think about what sort of debt terms would we typically provide to that off taker for its overall business and to what extent can we be, can that lender be more um, generous, I suppose, when lending to a project in which they are an integral counterparty, um, recognizing that a solar asset um, ought to be um, a relatively um, stable and, and steady um, business proposition compared to most, you know, most other um, investment types that a, a senior lender could, um, could make. Well, so good, good, good news then. Uh, hopefully for the uh, for the future. Um, what I'd like now is a, just a very topical question. Um, you know, given given the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, and, and all the various consequences of that, uh, you know, how has it, in your opinion, um, if at all, affected the uh, the new build market for subsidize subsidy free solar projects? Um, especially given things like as well, you know, low power price forecasts in the future as a result of that. What, what has the impact been, do you think? Yeah, I, I, mean, I suppose you could look at a few different components here. Um, I've already mentioned that it is perhaps caused the, the PPA off takers to, to, to think about overall business planning in the short, mid and long term. And, and um, in some ways, it could be seen as a, as a, a helpful thing um, in that it, it, a corporate PPA allows them to pinpoint one, one area of cost base and to lock it down into a certain component. So um, in a period of volatility, try and um, build some stability within their cost base. Um, however, clearly, a lot of business decisions are going to be um, reconsidered and, and carefully considered in these sort of uncertain times. So um, it, it will be good to start seeing, um, I guess, further, further clarity clearly, which might unlock decision making around long term um, corporate PPAs, for example. Um, in terms of the, the construction of, of these solar assets, as you mentioned, um, you know, Clearly, there are still huge amounts of appetite from the EPC community to, to build out solar projects. Um, as I've already mentioned, solar is not considered to be a particularly challenging asset class from a construction perspective. I think the greatest um, difficulty that can emerge is, is linked to transportation of certain key components internationally. Quite commonly, for example, the, the, the panels themselves are manufactured overseas. And so I think 
anyone building a new solar asset today will have to very carefully consider what the sort of supply chain timetables look like um, and what that means for the overall expected build time for a new solar plant. Given that we're not um, typically looking at subsidised assets at the moment, it's unlikely that many of these new builds will have a, a drop dead um, deadline beyond which, you know, if missed, a subsidy is suddenly no longer available mm -hmm. to the project. But, but commonly under the PPAs we've discussed, there will be a long stop date that says, you know, your asset needs to be operating by a certain date for, in order for us to honor that price for, for the long term. Um, so the timetable still um, remains a key component and needs to be very carefully considered and linked to all the various um, key contractual nuances around things like force majeure definitions um, to ensure that there's no um, unwelcome surprise linked to a factor that we're very clearly aware of today, uh, which is COVID-19. Absolutely, yes. And, and yeah, redrafting and drafting of force majeure clauses, change of law provisions is uh, very much been a lawyer's dream in this uh, in these last few months um, in, in terms of uh, any contract, really, uh, and the impact that COVID-19 has had. Um, thank you. So uh, you know, lastly, Pete, before we finish, um, this is uh, a question that we're asking uh, everybody uh, before we sign off. Uh, could you provide us, please, uh, three words uh, that represent us, in your mind, getting and achieving net zero? Um, yeah, okay. It's, so it's a difficult question and a difficult, um, I guess, objective as well. So <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so three words. Um, that will facilitate us reaching net zero. Um, I'd start with by saying demand. Um, by that I mean from the off-taker community. Then I'd say ambition. Um, and really that comes from the developer community first and, and then hopefully the funder. And then sustainability would be my third word um, i mean from the perspective really of the investor and the underlying provider of funds to a manager such as foresight uh, very clear sustainability goals pushing forward the net zero agenda very good and then on the uh, from the opposite perspective for you three words that would stop us from getting to or achieving net zero so um, I'd start by saying returns. Okay. So that's the selfish funder in me saying that at the moment it, returns still look tight for unsubsidized solar. So we need to try and address that uh, in whatever way we can. Um, I'd then say planning, um, but really by planning, I mean, Practically, how do we push through so much new capacity that's required if we're planning to get to 45 gig or more? Um, then there will be bottlenecks inevitably within our existing processes that we need to address. And then lastly, I'd say um, volatility. So um, by this, I mean, how will our grid and our system respond to the injection or the increased penetration of a large amount of renewable capacity, solar being an intermittent generator, which would, if increased, change the dynamics of the, the supply demand uh, profile of the national grid. Uh, and that itself is a, you know, a huge topic. Um, lots of thought clearly going into that um, at all sorts of levels, whether it be storage or uh, demand or supply um, side balancing objectives. So uh, that's, a, that's a topic for another day, but it presents a challenge um, in terms of balancing the grid if we're going to achieve our goals of large scale solar build out. 
Nice one. And uh, it is a topic for another day, but a, a useful plug because we did actually have a, an interview with the National Grid, the, uh, the ESO, where pretty much that was uh, what was being discussed. So uh, anyone is free to, uh, to look at that and uh, listen to that to, to see what get their thoughts on, on exactly that point and what National Grid are up to. Um, Anyway, that is all we've got time for uh, today. So, Pete, thank you so much for joining us. Really interesting to, uh, to get your perspective um, on the, the solar market in the UK and, and what the future looks like um, uh, for subsidy-free projects. Um, this set, uh, interview will be available on the Waitman's website. We'll also be uh, it on uh, LinkedIn and other forms of social media uh, and perhaps Foresight will be uh, doing the same as well. So uh, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for listening um, and uh, that I do hope you'll join us again for another interview uh, and Pete. Yeah uh, thanks enjoyed enjoyed talking about it hopefully um, I made it clear that we're very enthusiastic about further UK um, solar opportunities, uh, keen to work with Pete, the right people to find the right structures to, um, to do more. Thank you very much and goodbye. Cheers.